theyeshiva.net. Okay, welcome everybody. Bruch HaShabayas. Thank you for coming this morning. Regards from the Holy Land. I took a taxi a few days ago. I took a taxi to the Kaisal from where I was staying. So uh, the driver, his name is Abraham, Abraham Imsalam. Imsalam. He comes from Morocco. So he seemed like an elderly Jew. So I asked him about his life. We were schmoozing. It was a shtickl journey. So he tells me that he was born as a baby in Morocco. And his family relocated and made Aliyah to Israel in the early 1950s. I think around 1951 or 1952. And he described to me how the first five years they had no electricity. And uh, the living conditions were very, very difficult. Lack of water, a lack of electricity. And he described to me all of his hardships growing up. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So I asked him afterwards, how does he like it here in this place? He says, ah, on your heavens, uh, I love it. <laughs> so I said, you had so many hardships here. Why do you say, where is this, this, why do you have this love? Where does it come from? So he looks at me <laughs> with a big smile and he says, Kizeshali. Because this is mine, this is my place, this is my home. It was very moving to hear from my taxi driver. I wanted to share that with you. To have the most wisdom. <laughs> yeah, the conversation was so good that uh, I forgot to pay him. And he didn't ask me for the money. I just left the car. I was rushing to the Kaisler to get there. I don't remember why it was. And uh, when I was already walking, I remembered. <laughs> And uh, I ran back and I gave it to him. He started to laugh. He says, Atat tzaddik. I said, Ani lo tzaddik, ani rak lo ganav. Lo tzaddik, ani rak lo ganav. But those words, Zesheli, this is mine, you know, this is mine. There's something very special about that feeling. You know, it's not perfect, but it's mine. It's mine. So this is actually, uh, I didn't think of telling this story, but it's a prelude to what we want to talk about today. And that is, if you didn't get a source sheet, it's on the Bima. It's on the Bima. You have uh, a source short sheet. It's just one page. Please take, because we're going to learn some things inside. Okay, today's class is dedicated by uh, Dr. Michael and Liz Michelle in loving memory of her father, Rav Yisrael Yitzchak Halevi Ben Harav Binyamin, who passed away 23 years ago on the 11th day of Tevis. Rabbi Irving Levy was a respected Talmud Chachim, a legendary Balchesed, and one of the earliest founders of the Munsi community, for those who are here from the 1950s. <laughs> so this class is dedicated in his memory and in his honor by his daughter and son-in-law and their family. Thank you very much. Tehei Nishmasi Tzruda, Betzer HaChayim, and those really who uh, laid the foundations for this community. It's incredible to see how it evolved, and he was one of the founding fathers, as they say. And may he remain an eternal source of light and inspiration to the Michelle family and to all of his children and grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and to all of the Jewish people. I also got a special request by the husband to mention the memory of his wife, Esther Bas Yitzchak. You may remember the story, Esther Horgan was murdered on the 5th of Tevis, 5781, in the Rion Forest, near her house in the settlement of Tel Menasha. So her yard site was just commemorated, and her husband asked me to uh, mention that as well. Hashem Yin Kamdama, and Tehei Nishma Satsura Betzer HaChayim, and thank you. So what I want to address today seems like a simple question, but like all simple questions, they allow us and they take us on a journey into deeper places. If anybody asks, what's the name of the Jewish people? And the answer is, we're called Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel. Our land is called Eretz Yisrael, the land of Yisrael. The Torah is called Torah Yisrael, the Torah of Yisrael. The Jewish people are called Bnei Yisrael, the children of Yisrael. Hashem is called Elikei Yisrael. 
But the truth is that the founding father of Judaism was not Yisrael. The founding father of Judaism was Avram Avinu. So you would think that our name should have appropriately been Bnei Avraham, the children of Avram, Eretz Avram, the land of Avram, Am Avram, the nation of Avram. For whatever reason, you don't want Avram, maybe because he wasn't born a Jew. He was, as they say in Yiddish, a Atzugekomener, a Gevorin, and Ishken Gevorinner. You know the difference. He became, he wasn't born. So you have Yitzchak. Yitzchak was certainly born as a Jew. He had a bris at eight days. So we should be called Am Yitzchak, Bnei Yitzchak, Eretz Yitzchak, Teres Yitzchak. But the fact is that our eternal name and identity has been acquired based on the third of the founding fathers, on the third of the patriarchs, on the third of the patriarchs of Israel, of the Avais, whose name was Yaakov, and later had a name change to Yisrael, in Parshas Vayishlach, his name was changed from Yaakov to Yisrael, and that became our eternal name. Till today, the Jewish people, throughout the, throughout the Chumash, throughout the Tanakh, throughout all of, welcome, throughout all of the Midrashim, and in our language, are called Bnei Yisrael, Am Yisrael, Eretz Yisrael, Teres Yisrael, Eleke Yisrael. <coughs> and that's the expression, a Jew is called Yisrael, a Yisrael, he's a Jew, or she's a Jew. Famous expression in the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Afal Pishachata, Yisrael who, even somebody who may have sinned, there's still a Yisrael, you don't say still a Yitzchak or a Yaakov or, or a Yitzchak or an Avram, you say a Yisrael. The motto of the Jewish people in many ways, what we say twice a day, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elekeinu Hashem Echad, we don't say Shema Avraham, Shema Yitzchak, Shema Yisrael, listen, hero, as they say in English, hero Israel, hero Yisrael, Hashem Elekeinu Hashem Echad. Why? Why is it that it was the third one, not the number one and not number two, who gave us, <coughs> who gave us our name? So, there's a fascinating medrash that asks this question and answers it. In your source sheets, it's the first one. It's from the Sifri. Sifri is the medrash on Sefer Dvarim, Bamidbar and Dvarim. This is Dvarim Lamed Aleph. Nemar daber al bnei Yisrael, like Nemar daber al bnei Avram, daber al bnei Yitzchak. Throughout the whole Torah, Hashem tells Moshe, speak to the children of Yisrael. They're also the children of Yitzchak. They're also the children of Avram. It should say daber al bnei Yitzchak, daber al bnei Avram. You can argue that would be more appropriate because Yaakov is only a grandson. It's more respectful to go back to the grandfather of Yaakov to the beginning. Speak to the children of Avram. You can't be a child of Yisrael if you're not a child of Yitzchak. You're not a child of Yaakov because you're a child of your grandfather, but your grandfather was a grandson of his grandfather. Answers the Medrash. L'fi shahaya avinu Yaakov mefachid kol yamov. Yaakov was scared. He was dreading something. V'oymar, he, he would say, Oili, shema teitzi mimeni p'soylas kederech sheyatza me'avaysa. Perhaps my offspring will be similar to what happened with my parents, my fathers and grandfather. Avram yatza mimenu yishmol sheavad avay dezara. Avram was a father, not only to Yitzchak, my father, he was also a father to Yishmael. And yet Yishmael <coughs> abandoned the value system of Avram Avinu. He engaged in idolatry, promiscuity. Yitzchak Yatzim Emenu Esav, my own father and mother, had a child and he became Esav. He was Esav. Avomimeni loitetse psalos. This is what he was concerned that I don't want that any of my offspring should <coughs> ultimately become abandoned and alienated. And this, how do we know Yaakov was thinking about this? There's a fascinating story in the Gemara Psachim, the next source, Psachim Dafnon Vav, Talmud Psachim, page 56, about what happens at Yaakov's deathbed. Bikesh Yaakov legalis laban of Ketz HaYomen v'nestalkim emenu shechina. Yaakov wanted to reveal to his children the end of days, the time of Mashiach, and the shechina, the divine presence, departed. This is when all of his children surrounded him on his deathbed in Parshas Vayechi, and he said, come, gather together. I want to talk about the end of days. And suddenly the divine presence departs. Omar, he says, Oy, Sheme chas v'shalom yesh b'mitasi posel, kavram sheyatsu memenu yishmal, v'avi yitzchak sheyatsu memenu esav. Perhaps one of the people standing around his bed, one of my children, I don't know about it, has been disqualified from joining the eternal family of the Jewish people, and there's a precedent for it. Avram Avinu's son Yishmael didn't follow Avram's path. Yitzchak's son Esav Eisler did not. They left, they departed. They chose a different path. Amru Leibanov, when the children hear this, 
that Yaakov Avinu is suspicious, and that's why perhaps the Divine Presence departed. They responded and they said to him, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloikeinu, Hashem Echad. And here Yisrael is not generic Yisrael, it's specific Yisrael. Shema Yisrael, Hashem who is our God, is one. Meaning, Amru, Keshem Shem Belibcha Ela Echad, Kach Ein Belibenu Ela Echad. In your heart is one, in our heart is also one. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloikeinu, our God, is one just like yours is one. In other words, the same oneness that you own in your heart, that you live with in your heart, that same vision of oneness, the oneness of the universe, the oneness of humanity, the oneness of the cosmos, the oneness of a person, the harmony of life under the sovereignty of oneness, Hashem Echad, that's in our heart also. It's not only in your heart. If it's in your heart, it's also in our heart. Our heart is a mirror of your heart. When Yaakov heard this, he opened his mouth and he said, Blessed is the name of his glory and royalty forever, for eternity. So grateful that this was the response of all of his children, each one of them who was surrounding his bed. Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, Yisach, Zvulun, Don, Naftali, God, Asher, Yosef, and Binyamin, <coughs> and probably Dina, whoever was around the bed, he was so grateful for this that he said, Baruch Shev Malchus And indeed, this is an important line because till today when we say Shema, we insert this extra verse, even though it's not a verse. Nowhere in the Chumash will you find Baruch Shev Kved Malchus And in fact, it's an interruption because in the Chumash it says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. And the next line is, Vahaftas Hashem Alekecha. So Baruch Shem is really an interruption. In Chumash, Parshas Vashanon, there's no Baruch Shem. And you're not supposed to interrupt in Shema, which is why we do it silently to show that it's of a different level. But why do we put it in? Because that's what Yaakov said after he heard his children say Shema Yisrael. Now the question is, Yaakov said it, why are we saying it every single day? This means that we're trying to reconnect to what Yaakov was saying. Yaakov was saying, Baruch Shem Kved Malchus what he was grateful for all of his children. So when we say Baruch Shem, you're not just thanking God for creating the world, that too. You're thanking God for your children. And the Chazal felt that every time you say Shema Yisrael, don't just go to Vahafta. Repeat the grateful expression and accolades and praise that Yaakov Avinu said, even if we do it silently, that Yaakov Avinu said that day, we do it eternally, even though we're not having a conversation with our children usually when we say Shema Yisrael, because they're not telling it to us, we're saying it. And yet, this is a meditation and a time to reflect on the gratefulness for our children. The next Medrash, which is in Parshas B'chukais of Ayikri Rabbalah Medvav, points out an interesting anomaly in Chumash. It says, V'zacharti esbrisi, <coughs> excuse me, V'zacharti esbrisi Yaakov, af esbrisi Yitzchak, af esbrisi Avram. I'm going to remember the covenant with Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. But by Avram and Yitzchak, the word af is used. Af means sometimes a nose, or it means wrath, anger, v'chara, af Hashem. Yaakov lived a life in which mitosay shleima, very fascinating expression. Mitosay literally means his bed or his bedroom where the bed is. His bed was wholesome. What does it mean his bed was wholesome? It doesn't mean he had a good mattress. <coughs> it means that his entire bedroom which is the source of the family, was a shlema. It was wholesome. Avram had a Yishmal who came out of him, and all the children of Keturah. Yitzchak Esav and all of the generals of Edom. Yaakov Kol Ban of Tzadik. All of his children were righteous, and they continued the path of Yaakov Avinu. That's what they meant in Parshish Miketz when they told the Prime Minister of Egypt, who was really their brother, We are all the children of one individual, one person. In other words, we are all together. We are all part of a single collective. It's not just we have one father biologically. Esav also had the same biological father like Yaakov. But we have one father spiritually. Our father is our guide. 
to the point that the Medrash says in Bereshit Rabbi in Vav, Bachur Shabaava is a Yaakov. The chosen one from among the patriarchs is Yaakov Shenemar, Ki Yaakov Bachar Lo Yo Yisrael is Golosi. We say it every morning in Psukkot Zimra from Tehillim. Hashem chose Yaakov. Here, Yaakov, again, is not only generic, it's individually. Yaakov was the chosen one from among the obvious. Why? Says the commentary, Based on the previous measures, because Mitasei Shlema, his entire family, remained wholesome. There's a fascinating Rashi in Parshas Vayechidus Parsha. It says that when Yaakov met Yisrael, he was already ill. Yaakov bowed down to the head of the bed. Vayishtachi Yisrael, our Roi why to the head of the bed? He turned to the top of the bed and he bowed to it. So Rashi says, Roi Shamita means he bowed down to the fact, Shahoysa Mitasei Shlema. Again, he was thankful for his bed, that the marriage, his relationships produced a family where everybody continued his path. There was not one person who abandoned the values in the path of Yaakov. Shaire Yosef, Melechu. Yosef is a king, a, non, a king in a non Jewish country. And he was kidnapped and he grew, he grew up among Gentiles. So the natural thing should have been for Yosef to assimilate. But now Yosef, as a king, as a prime minister, is still the same tzaddik, the same righteous child. Yaakov prostrated himself with a very special sense of gratefulness for this unique experience. So the bottom line is, what do we learn from all these sources? That the reason we're called Bnei Yisrael, Am Yisrael, is because of a unique quality that Yaakov had that Avram and Yitzchak didn't have. And this was the tremendous difference between the three fathers in terms of their children. Avram left an heir who was Yitzchak, but Yishmal would not l- continue the legacy of Avram Avinu. Isaac left a ya- Yitzchak left a Yaakov, but he could not inspire Esav to continue the path of his father and mother. Yaakov Avinu somehow managed to inspire all of his children, and he didn't only have two, he had 12 of them, to stay the course. Each one of them, in their own way, continues the legacy of Yaakov Avinu. Each one of them became the father of a Jewish tribe. That's why we call them the 12 Shvatim, the yud Beis Shvatim. The word Shevet in Hebrew is a branch, like a scepter. Layasser Shevet Mi Yehuda, a branch from a tree is called a Shevet. They're all branches from one tree. Nobody said, I'm going to go find another tree, or I don't need the tree. That's why we still call them the Yudbeis Shvatim, because they identify themselves as branches of a single tree. Each one of them became an indispensable part of the Jewish nation. And the question I want to raise today is, how did Yaakov manage to do it? (laughs) And as you know, in 2022, it's not 2023. I'm sorry. Where do I live? I'm from the 70s. It's terrible. Okay. As we know in 2023, but it's also true about 2022, it's not such a simple question. How did Yaakov manage to do it? How did Yaakov, at his deathbed, look at his family and see that not one of his children abandoned the family, abandoned the values, became alienated from their father, from their mother, from from his belief system, from Torah, from Yiddishkeit? How did he have this success that all of his children continued on what they call today the derech, the path of Yaakov Avinu. Now you might say, he had mazel, right? Some families have mazel, right? Your next door neighbor has mazel. She's so much smarter than you. She's so much better than you. Mazel, I don't know. (laughs) But the truth is, it wasn't simple in Yaakov Avinu's family. (laughs) In other words, it's not to be expected. It wasn't like the trajectory was a simple, you know, each of his 12 kids, they just, you know, they were put onto the conveyor belt, before pre one and Yaakov said to the principal, just call me when he's ready for a shidduch, you know, call me in 20 years. That's not what happened. This was a very, very complex family, to put it mildly, and when you read through Sefer Bereshis, you see that the stakes were very high, and the situation, the circumstances were very close of ending up exactly like what happened to Avram Avinu and Yitzchak Avinu. For example, in Vayishlach, a few portions ago, we learn how angry Yaakov was at two of his sons, Shimon and Levi, for what they did in Shechem. Yaakov Avinu said, you are destroying my family. You are going to cause the extermination of the Jewish family. 
Yaakov Avinu said, you made me you made me smell, you made me look like a moral failure in the eyes of all of the nations. Yaakov was extremely, extremely upset at Shimon and Levi. At that moment, they could have said, okay, you know, you don't like us, we'll find something else. And it's not like Yaakov was just a small moment at his deathbed. Many, many years later, Yaakov Avinu tells Shimon and Levi, he curses their wrath, and he says that what you did in Esau, what you did in Shechem was something you learned from Esau. Klei Chamas, this is something you robbed, this is something you took from my brother Esau. You know, he compares their actions in Shechem. Yaakov was very upset about what they did. They had their reasons. They told Yaakov that they're right. Yaakov, this was an argument that the, that the, that the two sons and the father had. But Yaakov Avinu compared them to Esau in Parshas Vayechi. But unlike Esau, they didn't become like Esau. <laughs> They com- remained completely loyal to Yaakov. They were there at the deathbed. And not only that, Levi would ultimately produce Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron and Miriam and the whole family of Kohuna and Levi, a priesthood. They would serve in the Beis HaMikdash. They would show the greatest loyalty during the sin of the golden calf. So it was anything but simple. In the same parashas Vayishlach, we learn a story about Reuven. Another Another hair-raising story or mind-staggering story that could have easily ended his relationship with the family. The Torah is very blunt about it, even though the Medrash and the Gemara and Rashi explain it in a much more subtle way. But the way the Pasuk says it is that Yaakov went and had relations with Bilha, the Pilegish, Bilha, the concubine of Yaakov Avinu. Chazal say it doesn't mean literally, it means that after Rachel's death, Yaakov Avinu put his bed into the tent of Bilha. She was the maidservant of Rachel. And Yeruven went in without talking to Yaakov, without talking to anybody, and he took out Yaakov's bed from the tent of Bila, and he placed it in the tent of Leah. He felt this was an affront to his mother, Leah. And in other words, he interfered with the very private and intimate life of Yaakov Avinu. In Vayishlach, Yaakov doesn't tell him anything. But almost 60 years later on his deathbed, Yaakov speaks about it. It's interesting, Yaakov didn't talk about it for 60 years with Yeruven. It just says, Vayishma Yisrael, he heard this story, he never spoke about it with them. Not that he forgot it. On his deathbed, Reuven was already on Al-Tayid, and Yaakov was very Al-Tayid. Yaakov was on his deathbed, and he tells Reuven, he says, Pachas kamayim al ki oz yutsui Allah. You were impetuous like water. You, you were impulsive. You, you, did so, you made a rash decision, like the speedy flow of water. When you desecrated, you violated the mattress, the, the resting place, the, the intimate space of, of your father. He told this to Reuven. Rashi asked in the beginning of Sefer Dvarim why he didn't speak to him about it for 60 years. Why did Yaakov keep it in his heart? And it's an interesting answer. You know what Rashi answers? Yaakov was afraid that if he would, Reuven would say, you know what, I don't need you, I'm going to go to Esav. That's what Rashi says in the beginning of the Reuven would tell Yaakov, Shema, Yaakov said, if, if I do it, he's going to say, Edbak be'esov achicha, I don't need you. I have an uncle. He will welcome me with two hands. He has a lot of money. He's going to put me up in a suite on the fourth floor in his house. And he has a very good life. Esav was a very successful man. So Yaakov was quiet. It's an interesting question somebody once asked me. On his deathbed, he wasn't afraid? Or the same thing. Ah? Huh? Ah? Huh? But it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I, I, I hope to get back to it. Bleed now to remind me if I don't. Because <coughs> I wasn't planning to talk about it, but it, it fits in very nicely. So you want to know if he suffered from anxiety? Right. So you, you have to understand, when we, hear the wor- when we hear the word afraid, we right away associate it with our nervous system that is usually out of whack. But that's not what it means. It means that Yaakov was very, very aware of reality. And therefore, yeah, 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 yeah. In other words, he was extremely, he was extremely cautious. He had a vision, and that vision guided him his entire life, because he understood the consequences, seeing what happened to his brother and seeing what happened to his uncle Yishma. We'll see. Very good point. So, at that moment, when Reuven did what he did, even if Yaakov said nothing. You know, this was, he knew, he knew what an affront he did to his father. Not only that, Chazal say that he was busy with tshuva for many, many years. That's why he wasn't there when they sold Yosef, because he was fasting and he was dressed up in a sackcloth and he left the pit. 
This was nine years later. He was still repenting. But it would have been easy for Reuven to say, you know what, I don't really have a place in this family. It's time for me to leave. That didn't happen to Reuven. Then you had Yehuda. Yehuda was also very far from simple. Yaakov mentions it to him also on his deathbed. Yehuda, you know, he didn't know that it was his daughter-in-law, Tamar, who was dressed up like, as the Torah says, like a zayna, like a promiscuous woman, and he had relations with her. Of course, it turned out that it was Tamar, his, previous, his former daughter-in-law, and because of the whole process of Yibam that happened, that's not, that's not the, our discussion today. But in Yehuda's mind, he didn't know it. Tamar was dressed up, and Yaakov found out about the story. Yaakov also mentions the fact that it was Yehuda who sold Yosef into slavery. Now, if Yaakov knew it explicitly, or he sensed it, or he did know, that's a big argument. Rashi, Ramban, how much Yaakov knew about what happened. But he mentions, he intimates everything to Yehuda. He sold, he's the one who sold Yosef into slavery. He's the one who told his brothers, what are we going to leave him in a pit? There's no money to make here in a pit. Let's sell him and we'll make a couple of dollars. And that's what they did. They sell him for 20 silver coins as a slave. Wow, that's a big one, to sell your brother into slavery. <laughs> that would have been a very good reason to say, Yehuda, go find yourself another family. And Yaakov suffered because of that. Besides of what happened with Tamar, not only did it not happen, but ultimately Yehuda turns around and he becomes the leader of the Shvatim and he saves Binyamin and he is the one who causes Yosef to reveal himself to his brothers. And then the biggest, the biggest pal is Yosef, Yosef himself. Unlike Yishmael, uh, unlike Esau, who remained in his father's presence for so many years, Yosef was kidnapped. He was sold as a slave. He faced every temptation possible in, possibly in the world. He was cast into prison for 13 years in prison. And then he becomes the prime minister of Egypt, for heaven's sake. Egypt. No, no one in the Torah has Ervas Ha'aretz, the, the most depraved country in terms of morality. Chazal say, Shtufe Zima, filled, saturated with promiscuity. And Yosef is not just living there as an exile, as a fugitive, as a loner. He's running the country, literally. Parai said, You're the man. Nobody should lift up their arm or leg in all of Egypt without you. What do you expect? Such a type of child. He was only 17 years old. It's not like he went there when he was 85 years old. He was 17 years old. And that's what Rashi is saying here in Vayechi. Yaakov was astounded. A person who was Nishbal Ebein Agayim, he was abducted among the Gentiles. I told you last year the story of uh, Yaakov Tzvi Griner. Uh, <coughs> Yaakov Tzvi Griner was a kid whose parents were killed. <coughs> he was in the ghetto near Izbitz in Poland. And he literally ran away. His mother was killed, his daughter was killed, his father was killed, brother was killed. And he literally ran away and the Christians saved him. And he ultimately became a very, very prominent priest and a prominent bishop in Izbitz. And then a brother who survived through Siberia found him and they met. And he ultimately he moved to Israel. But he still ran a church in Israel, even though he would come to his brother for a seder. And he died last year at 90 or 91. And he had a Christian funeral and a Jewish funeral. It was, a, but it was such a sad, dramatic story. You saw here, the, the, they came from a chassidish family. But you see her a kid, he was saved by the Christians when he was seven or eight years old. He had nobody in the world. Literally, imagine an eight-year-old kid running from hut to hut, the middle of the night, to save himself from the Gestapo without a mother, without a father, without siblings. Eight years old, for heaven's sake. A nun took him in, and they ultimately put him into a monastery, and he did well. He was a Gute Kepala. He did well, and he became a very, very prominent and successful priest. His Jewish name was Yaakov Tzvi Grine. Later, he became... Uh, Pavlov, uh, I forgot his last name. But you know, you read these stories and you understand what happened. So Yaakov is astounded that Yosef, who had every reason to be upset that his brothers, upset at the family, alienated from the family, his father wasn't searching for him all these years, his father thought he was gone. Very natural that Yosef would be somebody who says, you know what, I'll create a beautiful future for myself elsewhere. One would expect that. Yishmol was sent out of Avram's house and a little while later he was already gone. He was already gone. Yo Yosef was not sent out of the house with his mother. Yosef was sold into slavery and thrown into prison. And here Yaakov looks at Yosef and he says, Oymed B'tzitkoi. He's still called, he's called Yosef HaTzadik. And he identifies himself with the family, with Yaakov. He becomes their greatest hosts. He feeds them and not just feeds them physically, but he becomes 
a spiritual uh, source of inspiration and light. Till this very day, we're still called Noyeh Katsayin Yosef. The Medrash says all the Jewish people are called Yosef. So the question is, it wasn't simple. What did Yaakov have? What did Yaakov do that Avram Avinu didn't do? That Yitzchak Avinu didn't do? Despite all of this, every one of the children remains connected to the family. You also have the story of Dina. (laughs) Also could have ended up in another situation. Dina (coughs) was abducted. And Dina Chazal say became pregnant, and the Shvatim didn't want to. They, she she couldn't come back to the house. It was very hard for her, and she had a daughter, Asnas, and Yaakov Avinu sent that daughter to Egypt, and ultimately that daughter ends up marrying Yosef. Each one of them, each one of the children, became one of the pillars of the Jewish people, including Yosef Atzadik. Each one fathers a tribe that would continue. <coughs> could become the story of Klal Yisrael. What can Yaakov teach us today? What did Yaakov do? What did Yaakov know? You see it most in Parshas Vayechi on his deathbed. Every person who leaves the world has a very deep desire to leave in a dignified way, knowing that their life was lived well. (laughs) You know, blessed is the person who could look back Everyone has regrets, we're all human beings. But (laughs) can look back and not regret and not have regrets that really shatter them at their last moments. (laughs) Even if there's fights in a family and there's discord in a family and contention in the family, parents hope that over the years siblings could learn to reconcile and come together and say goodbye to their parents in a unified way. When you look at Avram Avinu (coughs) before his death, he blesses Yitzchak. He doesn't bless Yishmael. Yishmael is gone. Even though he had a relationship with Avram, Avram would go visit him. Yishmael came to the funeral. Yitzchak's death, you don't see him t- talking to his children at all. Yaakov is the only one, before he leaves the world, he asks his whole family to come to him. And everybody is there. He says, come, gather together. And let me share with you about their future. And he speaks. He has that unique opportunity to speak to each one of the children. And he gives them each a different message, a different destiny, a different blessing, a different vocation. The Rechaim says that he identified the strengths of each one of the children and he gave him a unique mission. That's something you only see by Yaakov Avinu. Okay, let's change the subject for just a few moments, but we're going to get back to it. Today is Asar Tevis, the 10th day of the month of Tevis. As you know, it's a fast day, and the reason for it is, it's already mentioned in the Nevi'im, in Yecheskel, Samach Melech Bavel Al Yerushalayim. The 10th of Tevis is the day that Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian emperor, created a siege around Yerushalayim. The siege begins Asar Tevis. His troops surround the city, and they don't allow anybody to go in. They don't allow anybody to go out. This was an old strategy in ancient warfare, not just in ancient warfare, to be able to stop all the life supplies to be transmitted into a city, whether it's food, water, etc. And as a result of that, you force a crisis within the city, and ultimately there is surrender, or you weaken the population so much until you can easily conquer it. And we know the evolution of Asari Batavis. Asari Batavis begins the siege over Jerusalem. But later, ultimately, he can breach the walls. That happens in the summer in July, Shiva Sabatamas. And then three weeks later, <coughs> he ultimately destroys this city and burns the Beis Amikdash down to the ground. This is the first Beis Amikdash on Tisha, Tisha B'Av. And then later, there's some Gedalia, the fourth fast, because the last leader of the Jewish people left in Eretz Yisrael is killed, Gedalia ben Achikam. And that becomes the fourth fast, some Gedalia. So these are the four fasts of Divide Kabbalah that were already instituted by the prophets. And it's really an amazing thing, you know, somebody asks me, he says, it's such a schlep to fast, I hate fasting. Now, if somebody can't fast, they can't fast. You speak to a rav and perhaps you can get a hetter. But I explained to the person, I just want you to understand the power of this. You're talking about a story that happened around 2,600 years ago. That's a long time. You know, somebody once asked a Chinese politician, what do you think about the American and French Revolution? He said, it's too early to tell. You know, you think, how old is America, right? How old is America? <laughs> 1776, we're all babies. So 
I said, you know, when you're fasting today, you're, you're directly connecting, not just to your Zayde, to your, to your Elta Zayde, to your Elta Baba from, from, from Europe, from Poland, from Galicia, from Hungary, from Russia, 80 years ago, 90 years ago, which is also beautiful. But you're literally directly connecting to a chain that goes back thousands of years. And you're saying, you know, we're part of that story. Their grief is our grief and their hopes are our hopes. So it's a very powerful thing when you think about it. And it's not just a memory in Wikipedia. It's a memory in Jewish life. You know, we say slichus, we fast, we don't eat, we don't drink, etc. There is a fascinating prophecy of Yeshaya Hanavi about the rebuilding the walls of Yerushalayim when Mashiach comes. And Yeshaya Hanavi says, we said in the Haftar of Parshas Re'et, one of the Shiva de Nechemta, the seven weeks of, consol- of consolation, of comfort. Yeshaya Hanavi says, it's in chapter 54, Nun Dalad of Yeshaya. It's your next source, V'samti kad choid shim shoy sayich. The prophet quotes Hashem. I will turn your walls, the walls of Jerusalem will become, will, will become kat koid. Some say shim sayich means windows. The windows of the Jewish people will be made of kat koid, either the windows or the walls, the fortresses. What does kat koid mean? Kat koid, what is that? Your walls or windows will be made of kat koid. So I don't know what it means. So the Gemara in Baba Basra, Dafayin He, Amar Reb Shmuel Bar Nachmeni, Reb Shmuel said, Pligi tre malache birikia. Two angels in heaven argue about this word katchay. Now you have to understand how unique this is. Usually if there's an argument, so you have two sages, and they argue what it means. Reb Shmuel had knowledge of the fact, and the question is how he knew this, Taisvis discusses this, but two angels in heaven argued about a Hebrew word in Yeshaya, katchay. Who? Gavriel and Michal. Two angels. You have angel Michal and angel Gavriel. Here the order is Gavriel and Michal. In the Yalkut and the Medrash, it's first Michal, then Gavriel. But some say, no, it wasn't angels. It was two Amirayim, two rabbis, two sages in the West. Now this was written in Babylonia, Iraq. So the West of Iraq is Eretz Yisrael. The East from us is Israel. But from Iraq, Israel is on the West. So Marava is Israel. And who are these two sages? Yehuda v'chizkiya b'nei Rebchiyah. Rebchia had two children, Yehuda and Chizkiah. They're the ones who argue about Katchai. So here, there's an argument about who's arguing. Only Jews do this. It's not just we argue. We argue about who's arguing, right? It's not Yankel and Shmedel who argued. Nah, no, no, no. It's Lata and Dvaira who argued. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Thank God, Yankel and Shmedel. Thank God the angels weren't arguing. Yehuda and Chizkiah were arguing. And the Gemara wants us to know this. One opinion is the angels were arguing. Some say no. The sages were arguing. What's the argument? Chad Omar Shoyham, the Chad Omar Yoshve. One said, it's <coughs> the onyx, and the other one said it's jasper. Onyx and jasper. You have here in the English translation, O-N-Y-X and J-A-S-P-E-R. These are two unique, <coughs> two unique, unique gems precious stones, when it says your windows or your walls will be made of katchoid, what is it? One angel said it was onyx. That's what it's going to be made of. And the other one said, no, come on. It's going to be made out of jasper. That's going to be the gem from which all of our windows, our frames, the frames of the windows will be made and the walls of Jerusalem. That's how precious, that's how glittering, how dazzling, how beautiful. God mixes into the argument. Usually Hashem doesn't mix into arguments. Let the Jews argue. That's how they live. Okay, you didn't like that joke. So Hashem responds and He says, Let it be like this one and like this one. <laughs> That's Pshat Vesamti Kat Choyd. Kat Choyd is Kedain u Kedain. In Aramaic, Kedain means like this, and Kedain is like that. So it's like you'll say, should we put sugar in the cake or only coconut sugar in the cake? So you'll say, Mach Beda. That's usually not how you make compromises, right? Is Yankel right or Schmetel right? They're both right. It's like a guy comes to the rabbi and he says, you know, Yankel owes me $1,000. The rabbi says, you're right, go get it. 
So Yankel comes running in and says, it's the other way around. Shmedel owes me $1,000. He says, you're right, go get it. So his wife says, how can they both be right? He says, you're also right. What does it mean, lehevei kedein or kedein? They're arguing about something. Hashem says, kat koid, kedein u kedein. <laughs> he already anticipated the argument. So the way the Navi said the word is to include both sides. Let it be onyx and let it be jasper. In other words, the windows will be a combination of both. The walls will be a combination of both. Now when people read these stories, they seem so strange. Like, what's the meaning of this? First of all, the angels are arguing. What is the meaning of that? Second of all, who cares? Third of all, why, do, why are they arguing this way or that way? What's the svara? First of all, why is God mixing in? <laughs> There's so many arguments. Beis Shami and Beis Hillel argue how many Hanukkah candles you should light each night. Beis Hillel says the first night one, the last night eight. Beis Shami says the first night eight, and the last night one. Hashem doesn't say, do both. You can't do both. Either I light one, or I light eight. There's an argument, and we have a system of how halacha decides when there's arguments. There's arguments about thousands and thousands and thousands of details in Jewish law. That's how the system works. Because not everything is specified in the Torah. Whatever is specified, is specified. How many walls does a sukkah need? It doesn't say in the Torah clearly. It says you need to sit in a sukkah. How many walls? So there's an argument. Do you need three walls plus? Do you need two walls plus? The Allah is you need two, two, two walls and change. So now Hashem doesn't say let it be both ways. First of all, it can't be both ways. Either you have three walls or you have two walls. Two and a half walls or three and a half walls. Here it's an interesting thing. Hashem mixes into the argument. He says, Kat koid, let it be both. How are we supposed to understand this argument? In order to appreciate all of this, what was Yaakov's secret? What was Yaakov's perspective? How did Yaakov inspire all of his children? Let's go to our uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, our sixth source, the second to the last source, which is a little piece written by the Balatanya in the Sefer Torah Er, the Balatanya Parshas Lech Lecha on the Maimer Anoichi Magen Lach. Hashem tells Avraham Avinu, "I will protect you," and I want to learn with you a few lines, and let's try to elaborate and see what the Balatanya is teaching us here. Pirush Magen Avraham. What does it mean? We say every day in Shemayin Esra, Baruch Ata Hashem, Magen Avraham. Hashem is the shield, the protector of Avraham. Why don't you say Magen Yitzchak, Magen Yaakov? In the beginning of the blessing, we say Baruch Ata Hashem, Elkei Nevelkei Aviseinu, Elkei Avraham, Elkei Yitzchak, Elkei Yaakov. So at the end, you should say Baruch Ata Hashem, Magen Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov. He was the shield of all of them. No, only the shield of Avraham. So he explains, the Hine Noi that's known, and here we are introduced to a statement of the Zohar, one of the most basic Kabbalistic texts, saying that Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov embodied three characteristics. They embodied distinct characteristics and models in relating to themselves, their families, the world, and God. Because here's the question if Yaakov had a secret, why couldn't Yitzchak have the secret? Why couldn't Avram have the secret? They were also very intelligent and deep and holy people. But actually Avram Avinu embodied a certain quality. Yitzchak embodied a certain quality. And Yaakov embodied a certain quality. And there's a system how it evolves. It begins with Avram. It can't begin with Yaakov. It can't begin with Yitzchak. This child is Yitzchak. And the grandchild is Yaakov. What are these three qualities? They're known in Zoyer as Chesed, Gvur, and Teferis. Chesed is loving kindness. That's what chesed means. Generosity, connection, affection, love. That's Avraham Avinu's motto. Then you have gvura. Gvura is strength, discipline. Yaakov is a very interesting word, tiferes. What's tiferes? Tiferes usually means beauty or harmony, synthesis, colorfulness. Yeah, we'll see Yeah, But that's the word tiferes. In Zoyer it says, it says, the Novi Ma- Micha, the Novi Micah says, Titein emes le Yaakov, chesed la Avram. You give truth to Yaakov and kindness to Avram. Ask the Balatanya in Mat, Lekud Etoira Mat, is Avram even it wasn't true? Chas Vashal, Mitzchak wasn't true. Titein emes le Yaakov, chesed la Avram. It means there was a certain truth about Yaakov that was unique. A certain emes that Yaakov has. What is this emes? <coughs> So he starts explaining here. The Hine Noi that's known. 
שאברהם הוא בחינס חסד גודל עד מאוד. Beautiful words. Avram Avinu embodies in chesed God lad The only way I can translate it is insane kindness. Excessive, incredible, titanic, gigantic kindness. Chesed God lad A tremendous, excessive amount of kindness. Ad More and more and more. Beli shum Nothing will stop his kindness. <laughs> There's no force in the world that will be stronger than Avram Avinu's love. It's like, try me out. <laughs> my love will be stronger than your defiance. My kindness will not allow any obstacle to stand in the way. Everyone is good in his eyes. Not, you would think, some people are naive, you know. They put on glasses, they don't see anything. He says, no, because of a hurak toif. He himself is so filled with goodness, he sees goodness in everybody. When he puts on, when you put on Avram Avinu's glasses, you just see the goodness and the beauty and the power and the greatness right now, right now, in each person you encounter. Therefore he tells Hashem, Hashem tells Avram Avinu, I'm going to give you a child, he's going to be Yitzchak, and he says, I am happy if you're small lives before you. Shepirish, sheyichye la'ad lefanecha. Yishmal should live for eternity in your presence. Shubchines ein soiv bli gvul. I want Yishmal to live in Hashem's infinite presence. V'afal pisho yedeya ma'o Yishmal. Avram Avinu didn't know who Yishmal is. He knew the Yishmal. Avram Avinu knew the facts. Avram Avinu was, was a warrior. He was a leader. We sometimes think that a tzaddik Somebody who's naive, he's blindfolded, they're zetnish, they're weisnish, they're kicknish. You know, <laughs> I don't hear, I don't see, so everybody is a tzaddik. That's not the idea. He knows everything about Yishma. That's not a chush, you know, if I'm living in a different planet, everybody is good, everything is good. He knows who Yishma is. Afa pikein, machmas chesed godl v'tuva ya godl, Because of Avram's nature of infinite, tremendous, Kindness and love. He wants him to live and prosper and he should become his ear. He should live with an infinite kindness. In your presence and you're infinite. And that's what Chazal say. We learned earlier. Not like Avram from whom Yishmal emerged. He ultimately left. Because of the intense kindness, the tremendous kindness of Avram. Now, I'm going to read the next few lines. You're going to see a lot of going on here in terms of contrasts, and then we'll explain. Avul be'emes, in truth, ain my haroyu kain. This can't be the end of the story. This is not all the way. The way this is not the way it should be ultimately. Why? When Mashiach comes, it says, death will be swallowed up forever. And the spirit of impurity I will remove from the world, from the earth. Ultimately, one must eliminate all evil, all toxicity, all negativity and hatred from the world. And if the world is governed solely, by Avram Avinu's infinite kindness, the world could never reach the state of wholeness and purity the way it's during the Geula, during Mashiach. Yitzchak came as a counterbalance. Yitzchak came as a response to his father. He was like the second level, the second generation, which responds to the first generation. And Yitzchak introduces a new quality into Judaism. And that's din. Wow. What's din? Din means judgment, discernment. The word din doesn't only mean a verdict in a court. It's called a din, like a din. Din means a verdict, but it means there's discernment, there's a judgment, right? When there's a din, when there's a din Torah, or a din and mishpat, what do you say? This person is right. This person is wrong. You discern, you try to see. 
who's on the right, who, who's the giver, who's the taker, who's innocent, who's not innocent. It's a very complicated process. But that's what din is. Din is discernment. There is division. There's qualifications. There are verdicts. There's an element of judgment. Not judgmentalism. That's something else. But judgment. Beautiful. So Yitzchak solved the problem. From Yitzchak came Esav. Because of the harshness of judgment. Because of the strength. Kasha means the hardness. Kasha is hard. The hardness of discernment and judgment, it produced Esav. But what do you mean produced? Not a produced. But there was an ability for Esav to choose differently. al Yitzchak told Esav, you will live on your sword. The sword is the ultimate din. Ach Yaakov, Yaakov introduced something that allowed the whole bed, the whole family, to remain connected, to remain united. What is this? What, 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 is, what is the Balatanya teaching us here? <clears throat> what was the difference of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov? And it has to be in this order. <laughs> if you would start with Yitzchak or Yaakov, it wouldn't work. You have to start with Avram and Yaakov. No, it's not like Avram did the wrong thing. Yitzchak did the wrong thing. Avram Avinu embodied a certain quality that had to be the beginning of the Jewish revolution. It had to start with Avram Avinu. Then Yitzchak introduces a new quality. And then... On the, on the shoulders, what do we say? By us we say, a midget on the shoulders of the giant. The midget on the shoulders of the giant could reach much higher than the giant. <laughs> right? There was a teacher in a yeshiva, he once said, if I had Rothschild's money, I would be richer because I wouldn't quit teaching. You understand? So the midget can reach much higher, could reach much higher than the giant. But the only reason is because he's on the shoulders of the giant. Now, Yaakov is no midget, but my point is, Yaakov stands on the shoulders of Avram and Yitzchak. That's how you have to understand it. And because of that, he reaches a place of mitas yishlema. It's important to understand this because it's also true by, by all of us. You know, Often people look at their parents or grandparents and say, I'm not going to make the same mistake like my mother. You ever heard that? I'm not going to make the same mistake like my father. Not you. You should make all the mistakes of your mother. I'm not going to make the same mistakes like my father. I'm not going to make, right? Now, there's something very, very, very uh, sane and logical about that. But remember that sometimes, very often, people did the best they can with the tools they had. And it's only because people brought history to a certain place that we could become the Chachamim and take it to the next level. So when you say, I disagree with how things were done, Perhaps, and you should learn from mistakes. But we also have to understand that it's the experience of people with a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that gives us the backbone and the foundation to be able to build on it. So it's important to understand this. It's not like Yaakov Avinu said, Oh, Avram, what does he know about Chinuch? Yitzchak, oh, shine. It's not how Yaakov looks at it. Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov are a unit, or trio. And it develops in this stage where there's chesed, and then there's another sensitivity called gvura, and then there's the third sensitivity, which is called teferis. What does this mean practically? Let's begin with Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu's motto, the Balatanya, is endless and unconditional love. In other words, wherever you are and whoever you are, Avram Avinu just saw the goodness. He saw it right here, Right now, he saw the spark, he saw the light, he saw the holiness, he saw the godliness, and therefore he embraced you fully. <laughs> he embraced you fully without any, this wasn't fake, this was authentic, it was warm, it was real. There were no strings attached. If you were good, en- if you're good, en- if you were good enough for God to create you, you're good enough for me to love you. <laughs> That's his motto. <laughs> If you were good enough for God to create you, you're good enough for me to be here for you, to love you. Three Bedouin Arabs come to his home. Yeah, He didn't ask them which seminary they went to, which yeshiva they went to, where they got smicha, how many years they were in Eretz Yisrael. He didn't ask them for a resume, even though they were prostrating themselves to the dust on their feet. 
He said, Pajalista, my home is your home. I just want to tell you a beautiful story. You talk about, you know, just genuine, unadulterated kindness, which you later see by Rifka, Avram's daughter-in-law, with the camels. You know, if I'm a little girl, and I go down to a well, and it's hard, right? And I bring up a big bucket, and I put it on my shoulder, and I'm ready to go home. And thank God we can call it a night. You know, I did my chore for the night. And then there's a fellow who just came with 10 camels and a lot of money. and looks like a hush of a gentleman. And he wants a drink. I'm a nice person. What do I do? I say, here, you can take my barrel, <laughs> take my bucket, and Nutzke Zutay, let me know when you're done. I'm going to sit down and meditate a little bit. Right? If you were Rifki, you might say, whoa, 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 one second. Well, what am I, being used here? I'm, I'm going to be used? I'm going to start schlepping. Now, your camels, the chak? You have there a bunch of guys. You went on a journey. Why don't you get to work? Huh? You would think that it's codependence, right? But Rivka wasn't codependent. You could see later she wasn't codependent. So this is an interesting thing. Rivka became a counterbalance to Yitzchak. Okay, but let's not jump ahead of ourselves. I want to share with you a story. You remember this, when was it? Uh, quite a few years ago, I think 2009, the terrorist attack in Mumbai, in India. It was one of the worst terrorist attacks in recent history. They came from Pakistan. They wreaked havoc in India. Close to 200 people lost their lives, including six of our holy brothers and sisters who were in the Chabad house of Mumbai. Chabad house was led by two people, Gabi, Rabbi Gabi and Rifki Holtzberg, Hashem Yun Kamdamam, who were murdered on that dark night, and their son Moishi was saved. You remember the story by the maid? Last year I went to celebrate his bar mitzvah with him. Oh, really? You were in, you were in Mumbai. Rifki Holzberg, before her marriage, her maiden name was Rosenberg. And her parents, of course, were sitting shiva. After they found, they retrieved the bodies, they brought them to Eretz they buried them on Harazesim, together with the other Kedoshim from Mumbai. Her parents, Rabbi and Rebetzin Rosenberg, who happened to know, were sitting shiva. In the middle of shiva, a young woman comes in, an Israeli woman, and she has this uh, big box, and she gives it to Mrs. Rosenberg, Rifki's mother, and she says, this is from your daughter. She says, what is it? She says, open the box. She opens the box, and she sees a beautiful diamond ring, beautiful, stunning diamond ring, or an onyx, jasper, whatever it was made out of, a beautiful diamond ring, and a very, very elegant, sophisticated gown. You know, that you would wear for, for a wedding of, of a sister of a very close relative. So Mrs. Rosenberg turns to her and says, this is Rifke's? Yeah, how does it come to you? She says, I'll tell you the story. She's an Israeli girl, grew up in a secular home, went to the Israeli army. She finished her years of service. And like many Israeli soldiers, they go to the Far East to, uh, I don't know what the word is, discover themselves, uh, relax, get out of a country that's tense, whatever it is, it's an interesting experience. And they go, some of them travel, and she was one of those girls, and she went to India. Now, India is a very complicated country, it's not for now, but she got into trouble over there. And she ended up in one of the worst places you ended up in India, in a prison. And this is a prison where there's no gefilte fish. You go to some prisons here, you know, there's gefilte fish for Shabbos and herring. I once went to, when I visited Rubashkin in prison, there was another prison. I went in over there to visit the people. They said they have four types of fish for Friday night meal. I'm like, wow. <laughs> okay, it's not a good place for anybody, of course, but I'm just saying the Indian prison was not that way. It was like Yosef in prison. She was with people who are criminals. This is a Yiddish Amedel from Eretz Yisrael. She was in a terrible, terrible, dire situation and without a way of getting out. She studied the process and spoke to the people and she realized that with a good bribe, she can escape. And she bribed the person she had to bribe and after a few months, she escaped. Where do you go? In the middle of the night, you're a fugitive from prison, Vugatman. So she goes to the Chabad house in Mumbai in the middle of the night, she wakes up Rifki Holtzberg and she welcomes her at the door and she says, where are you coming from? I'm coming from prison. Now, what would I do if somebody opened, uh, came to my house in the middle of the night coming from prison? 
you know. She says, come in. <laughs> come in. And she tells her the whole story. She says, what do I do? She says, what do you do? You have to get out of India ASAP. This is a lot of corruption here, and you have to get out of here. If they catch you, who knows what's going to happen. They could put you there for 20 years for life. You have to get out of here. She says, but they're going to investigate my documents. She says, I'm going to help you. But what do you mean I'm going to help you? They're going to, they're going to figure things out. She says, Baruch Hashem, the computer system here is not developed. <laughs> they won't figure everything out. Yeah, but they'll ask questions. So Rifki turns to her and says, I have an idea. And she takes out her most beautiful gown. She gives it to her. She takes her diamond ring and says, you put this on. If you come in and out dressed like you're dressed now, you know, she was like an Israeli backpacker in India, so you know how she was dressed or not. They can investigate. But if you're wearing such a gown and such a diamond ring, they'll see you're of a different caliber. They'll just let you go. And she went, and she said, I got back to Israel. And I always thought I have to return the items, and I never did. But now I read about their death, and I'm here in Israel, so I came to give you back the gown and the diamond ring of your daughter. So Mrs. Rosenberg takes the box from her and says, I want to tell you something. I saw my daughter a few weeks ago, and I noticed that her uh, tabat yahalom is missing. Her, her diamond ring is missing. So I said, Rifki, where's your diamond ring? She looked at me and she said, Ima, my diamond ring is on Shlichus. <laughs> my diamond ring, I'm on Shlichus, and my diamond ring is also on Shlichus. <laughs> That's it, she told her. <laughs> I didn't know what is my daughter up to. What is she talking about? But I let it go. Who knows what she means? Maybe she doesn't want to tell me the story. Now I understand what she meant. So the opening story of the Jewish people is this type of kindness. Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu, he will just see your goodness and he will dance with it till the end of love. He will celebrate it. He will highlight it. And when you're sitting in Avram Avinu's bosom, you cannot help but reciprocate that type of love. Avram Avinu was not naive. He could have judged. He knew everything about people. He fought when he had to fight. Avram Avinu was a very, very educated person. He's the one who broke his father's uh, idols. He fought Nimrod. He wasn't a man of superficiality. He wasn't a person who didn't have principles and therefore you could love everybody. If you don't have principles, you know there was a Jewish comedian who he once said, I am a man of principles. And if you don't like my principles, I have another set of principles. You know, you have such people. <laughs> I have another one in the closet. It's fine, I'll take that out. Avram Avinu had principles. He fought with his life. He gave his life for it. But who was he? He was, he says, who achtoiv. He was so saturated with goodness, with godliness. That's what he saw. You know, he had those, those call them magical glasses. Some people just have them. They look at a person and they see goodness. Sometimes the hardest people to do this with is your own children. You know, if a stranger comes to my house for shoppers, you know how it is, right? Right, your, your, your friend from class, you were with her in Geitza, or in some seminary in Israel 29 years ago, and her son, who's struggling, ends up in your house for Shabbos. And you call her up, Mitzray Shabbos, he's such a sweet boy. <laughs> he's so charming, he's so geschmack, and you give him all the love in the world. What about your own son? It's much harder. <laughs> your son is also very charming, by the way. Your son is also very sweet. When your son goes to somebody else's house, he also cleans up. In your house, he doesn't clean up. Of course not. You don't do that to your own mother. But everybody else's house he comes to, he cleans up. He makes it spotless. <laughs> but it's hard because when you're so close to somebody, you want more and you feel the disappointment. Avram Avinu had that ability even with Yishmael. Yishmael was his own son. And even when Hashem told him, Yishmael should not be in your house. It says in Pirkei de Rebelezer that Avram continued to visit Yishmael. You would think Hashem said, Lech Lecha, send them away. God said, what do you want for me? Avram Avinu said he said to send, he didn't say not to visit. It says in Pirkei the he would constantly go visit Yishmael. And at the end, what does Rashi say? Yishmael did tshuva. He did tshuva personally. He came to Avram Avinu's funeral. He let Yitzchak lead the funeral. 
Yishmael himself remained connected to his father, even though he didn't continue the path in the sense of bequeathing it to his children and his grandchildren. Yishmael became Yishmael, and we know about our cousins Yishmael. We still have some issues over there. But this was the power of Avram Avinu. Now comes Yitzchak. And Yitzchak is a completely different and opposite quality. Yitzchak looks at you, and Yitzchak also has a lot of love. Yitzchak is not unloving. He grew up in the house of Avram Avinu. In fact, he looked just like Avram Avinu. The apple didn't fall far from the tree. But when Yitzchak looked at you, or Yitzchak looked at your child, he didn't only see you for what you are today. He saw you for who you can be tomorrow. And he challenged you to become that person. You know, a connoisseur, right, looks at a stone. I see the stone and I'm like, okay, throw it out. The connoisseur says, no, 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 no. <laughs> this can give me $5 million. There's unbelievable, Chabad has beautiful melodies. There's unbelievable melodies that Hasidim, who were very uh, successful in business, would go to weddings of their colleagues. And they heard waltzes. You know what a, 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 a waltz? And they adopted them into beautiful Hasidic melodies. Sometimes people hear a tune, and if you're a connoisseur, you're like, ah! Yitzchak Avinu had that ability to be able to see that type of potential. So therefore, he challenged you to get there. He saw that your potential of who you could be if you're going to be stimulated and you're going to be guided. Let's take education, whether it's your students, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your community. There's two distinct paths in education. And I'm going to ask a question here. You don't have to all answer at the same time, <coughs> but I want you to think about it. <coughs> Do I have to learn? I get this question probably 35 times every single day, sometimes 100 times a day, without exaggeration. Do I have to learn to accept and love each one of my children, each one of my disciples, each one of my siblings, or anyone for that matter, exactly the way they are today without any conditions, without any strings attached? And Rabbi Jacobson, if you say yes, tell me how, when he or she is betraying everything I taught them, everything I sacrificed for. It's a good question. <coughs> Sometimes parents, because of this dilemma, do some very extreme things. Some of them shut down emotionally. They can't. They don't want to be aggressive and negative, but they can't accept. They can't remain present. I know a father, he told me, my son comes home in the evening, I run up to my bedroom and I lock the door. And he was very proud of himself. <laughs> I said, why do you run up? He says, I don't want to be confrontational. If he comes in and I see him, I'm going to start fighting with him and arguing. And we're going to argue for four hours. So what do I do? I run up to the room, I shut, I shut the door. He also does something else, which he didn't tell me, and that is he shuts down. He shuts down, he can't be there. I understand. He's very proud of himself. At least he doesn't fight. He said, how, how can I, what do you want from me? I can't stay there and accept and, and, and watch somebody destroying their life and destroying my family's life and say nothing. It's a very, very difficult dilemma. <coughs> Is that the right path? Full acceptance with no ifs, no buts, no whens. What if my child is so different than me? What if they are espousing different values? What if they chose a very, very different path? What if they have belief systems and perspectives that in my mind are completely destructive and untrue? You know, at some stage you have children who they start telling you how Israel is illegal, right? I'm sure some of you know that. The moment you become more open and liberal and progressive, you know, Israel is an apartheid state. <laughs> the Palestinians are the tzaddikim. The Israelis are the rishayim. <coughs> Comes very hard for parents. It's not so simple. And many of the Friday night's dinners turn into a third world war. Verbally, at least, and sometimes even more than verbally. It becomes extremely difficult. Does somebody say... I will love you, I will enjoy you, I will celebrate you, I will embrace you, I will hug you, I will bond with you, I will connect with you, I will hang out with you, I will have fun with you. 
I simply because I could see all the good in you right now. I could see how much goodness, how much beauty, how much holiness. Yes, I may disagree with some of your behaviors and I'll keep it to myself. Maybe I'll talk about it with my friend or my therapist. <laughs> I may have some, you know, deep pain here. Maybe some important behaviors. We have a serious disagreement, unfortunately, but it will not alter my full acceptance of who you are right now, at this moment, in my house, in my embrace. Is that the right path? Or maybe there's a different path. Maybe the right path is, I can't make peace with who you are today because I see who you can be tomorrow. I see your pain. I see your potential. I see <laughs> your crisis. I see your struggles. I see your dilemmas. I may not judge you for the decisions you're making today with the tools you have, but I will not surrender to mediocrity and make believe that this is all there is to you. I'm not going to make peace with, a super, with what I think is a superficial self when I know what you can become and what you really are. I see your innate wholeness. I see your pnimius. I see your core. I don't want to surrender to a self that is much more superficial. So therefore, I make sure to explain to you who you can be. Sure, because I love you, not because I hate you, because I love you. Now, anybody who tells me this is an easy question to answer <laughs> is not saying the truth probably, unless you're a very, very worked out person who you dealt with this for many years. This is not an easy question to answer. Because again, somebody who doesn't have principles, somebody who doesn't care, mela. Somebody who's full of judgment, mela. But somebody who wants to do the right thing and wants to come from a place of, of real love and connection, it's not easy. The second path may just push the person away, maybe forever. The first path, though, may invite the person to remain stuck in their quagmire. Avram and Yitzchak represented these two paths. Each one has a very powerful truth. It's not called the truth. It's called truth, but not the truth. Not because they weren't true, chas v'shalom, but because each one embodied a specific quality which is incredibly amazing and powerful, but it has its limits. And therefore, Yishmael ultimately left. Each path on its own has something beautiful about it, but it's also lacking. I have to begin with Avram and Yitzchak to get to Esau, but ultimately from one came Yishmael, from another one came Esau. Now let's come to Yaakov. What's Yaakov? So I'm going to describe now Yaakov, and I'm just going to say this. It's much easier said than done. Because what I'm going to say now is not about a lecture. Even though it's looking, it looks like I'm lecturing, right? It's really not about that. And if you're just going to hear it as words, it's meaningless. I'm just telling you the truth. This is something that your nervous system has to integrate. And that's not easy. Because that has nothing to do with lectures. That has to do with self-awareness. How much I can really integrate this into my bones. There's words, words that go from a brain to another brain. But as Rabbi Tam says, There's words that need to find a home in my heart, in my facial expressions, in my, uh, in my body language. And you know your children read your body language much more than anything else. They know facial expressions. They feel your subconscious much more than your conscious. They always tell parents, you want to know what your subconscious looks like? Just speak to your kids. <laughs> Ask them to describe mommy when you're not there. <laughs> it's good that when they, you, if you ever overhear your child describing to his friend what type of mother he has. You learn a lot of interesting things. <laughs> it may not be so geschmack. And, you know, he may be wrong in many ways, but you may learn some very interesting things also as long as you don't become defensive. The, one of the biggest mistakes we make as parents is we become defensive. I'm going to prove how you're wrong, you're immature, you don't know what I did for you. What that does is it doesn't allow children 
to trust that they can express what they're feeling. Because once again, Tati or Mami had to shut down the conversation and tell us that they were tzaddikim. And under the circumstances, they did the best we can and we're just a bunch of spoiled brats who don't appreciate the $500,000 that we invested till age nine and the other three million that we've been investing just for their therapy. When you talk about serious topics, you have to sprinkle it with a little humor. So don't get so, uh, <coughs> don't get uptight. Yaakov Avinu was the synthesizer. What do I mean by the synthesizer? He took the quality of Avram as the first quality. But he realized he must integrate it with the quality of Yitzchak. Hence, all of his children, despite their struggles, and despite the fact that they came very close to ending up with the fate of Esau and Yishmael, ultimately remained pillars of the Jewish nation, each one in their own way. The Akedis Yitzchak even says, the reason they got rid of Yosef is because they thought by Avram Avinu, the legacy continued through one child, Yitzchak. By Yitzchak, the legacy continued through one child, Yaakov. Certainly by Yaakov, it's going to go through one child. And then they saw, who's that child? Yosef. <laughs> he got the colorful tunic. No, he got the great stuff. So we're going to be the excluded ones. And they knew that's not true. We're all part of Klal Yisrael. So Yosef is posing the danger. That's what Akedis Yitzchak, Rabbi Yitzchak Arama from Spain says. That's why they got rid of Yosef. Very interesting. So what happened here? So let's now understand. Now this is such a sensitive topic because when you're dealing with emotions, there's so much bias and so many unresolved stuff in my system that they can all get mixed into the emotions and camouflage themselves as righteous when they're really undermining what has to be done. So I'm saying that all these words always have to be processed and understand how genuine am I and how much am I just paying lip service to sounding like a very good person who knows what's going on and not backwards or underdeveloped. You see, it's not that Yitzchak is really a contradiction to Avram Avinu. What Yaakov had to learn is that Avram and Yitzchak are really one. Tiferes is not a cholent where you take a little bit of this you take a little of this, you mix it together, and you hope the final product is not too bad. That's not what Yaakov is. Yaakov is a completely different reality. It's not taking Avram and Yitzchak, you mix it into the, a little salt, a little sugar, a little sugar, hopefully they will come out good. It's a reality that sees the oneness of Avram and Yitzchak. What do I mean by that? Understanding that Yitzchak is really one with Avram. Ela told us Yitzchak ben Avram. Avram hoyle des Yitzchak. Rashi says, Yitzchak reflected the face of Avram Avinu because in the Pnimius, in the core, they're one. Even though it's expressed in different ways and sometimes in opposite ways. <coughs> if my love is very real, it's really real, I really see the good. And my conclusion is, I just love you and accept you. And it's real. And I'm telling you, it's not easy. But let's say it's, it's really real. It also has another message. Deep down, it has another message. And that other message is, do I really believe you're capable of more? Not you're capable of more because of my nachas. Not you're capable of more because you're disappointing me. Then I'm in a different place but that you're capable of more for you. <laughs> because it's your soul, because it's your life. What do I really, really believe? Do I really believe that you are who you are and there's nothing more to expect? And therefore, I'm going to celebrate you with my full heart and full passion. If I really love you today and I really believe in you today and I really celebrate you today, there's also something else that I see. I see your potential. I may see a lot of your pain. I may see a lot of your obstacles. I may see your nesioinus. I may know your life experience. I may know the traumas you're dealing with or at least be open to them. I may understand the limited tools that I had when you were a child raising you and understanding the consequences on you. And I may know 
what it means for you to really maximize your potentials, to really become a source of light to the world. I believe that you can conquer your fears and not become defined by your traumas. So expectation here is a very different type of expectation. Expectation here is not, I'm disappointed in you because you're not showing up at the family picture the way you should, and the nachas is compromised, and the shatchanim are not calling us the way they used to call us, and you're the one, the first one, because of whom Tante Fege is not going to come to our mitzvah tans. The first one. Because Tante Fega called me and said that if your daughter shows up at the mitzvah tans dressed like Chava before the tree or clothes, Ayid Tardot and Zayn, a Jew shouldn't be there. I got a call. A mother called me, that Tante Fega, whatever her name is, Big Tzadekas, said that if your kid comes to the mitzvah tans, I'm not coming. So who's more important, Tante Fega at the mitzvah tans or my daughter at the mitzvah tans? Why she had to call me Vesachnash? So I told her, call Tante Fege and say, Tante Fege, a tzaddikist like you should not come to our mitzvah tans. It's going to compromise. It's got, whatever. It's going to compromise your holiness. You stay home and say to Hillam for my mishpacha that God help us and take us out of our dirt. When you finish to Hillam, say it again. Then give some tzedakah for us. Then say some tzedakah or rena. And then to Hillam, but you really shouldn't show up. So she says to me, but Tante Fege doesn't show up at the mitzvah tans. It's like bishes. It's, 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 uh, it's not a mishpach anymore. I said, listen, for Tante Fege not to show up at the mitzvah tans is bishes. But for your daughter not to be invited to the mitzvah tans is pikuach nefesh. Tante Fege will be fine. We love Tante Fege. Her merits protect us all, and we're thankful to her. But she's going to be fine. If that's where expectations are coming from, I have not mastered Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu is always the first one. The foundation of Judaism is Avram. He is the f- eternal founding father of Judaism. Avram Avinu is the person who will just see godliness in every human being and will celebrate it without strings attached. You will be at my Shabbos table and you will feel really comfortable, not because I'm faking it, but because I worked on myself. I worked on my relationship with God. I transcended my ego. I transcended my insecurities. And it's an avoida. This is an avoida. Avram Avinu did this. He gave us this gift. Avram Avinu gave us this gift. The Gemara says in Baba Basra, unbelievable, I was just to Marissa Machpelah, the Gemara says that Rabbi No went down into the cave. And what does he see? I'm to Gemara. He sees Sarah combing out the lice from Avram Avinu's hair. That's what the Gemara says. Combing out the lice of Avram Avinu's hair. What's Pshat? Sarah was Gvura. What's lice? Lice attracts itself. You know how lice works? Why does it attract? It attracts itself. It gets food. Avram Avinu had so much love that the lice can also get food from him. And he needed a Sarah to be able to clean it up. That's why Hashem tells Avram Avinu what Sarah says. You listen. Hashem understood Avram Avinu. He understood Avram. Avram went to visit Yishmael afterwards too. Avram didn't change. But Hashem said if you want Yitzchak to have a chance to survive, you have to be able to listen to Sarah. Yitzchak was the opposite and he had a Rivka. You always need a spouse. Every man needs a spouse to be able to make him into a mensch. So when you're going to go home today, what did Rabbi Waiwai say today? He said that I was created to make you into a mensch. It's not going to go by so well. It's not going to go by so well. (laughs) Say we were both created to help each other maximize our potentials. That's how you say it. So what's the idea here? So let's understand. It starts with Avram Avinu. Because let's see the other side. If there's only demands and expectations, I see you, why are you dressed like this? <laughs> Go back to your bedroom. Again, it's not what I say, it's what I feel. If that's the model, 
I'm all about demands and expectations without the ability to enjoy me today, to enjoy your son and your daughter and your student today, the person is made to feel like garbage. And if they made to feel like garbage, what they feel is I have no value unless I become the person mommy and tati need me to become for their nachas. Deep down, I feel like a loser. And that pain will drive me further away from you. People think with demands and expectations, without understanding what the person is going through, you'll bring out the best in them. You have to be very careful. Because if the person feels now, oh, today I'm a piece of garbage, right? What does that do? This is not my home. This is not a place where I can be comfortable. That's Yitzchak when you don't have Avram Avinu. Just like Avram without Yitzchak is. I love you the way you are. Do you believe in me? No, no, there's nothing to believe in. You're a Nebuch. You're a broken Kaylee. You're going to be broken. Let me just celebrate you. You're missing that love. The other way, I see potential and I demand it and I expect it. Today I'm a loser, right? It's too painful to be here. This means I'm garbage. This reminds me of the failure that I am, how much pain I caused you, how I deprived you from your nachas. Children don't want that. They don't want to cause their parents pain. I'd rather live somewhere else than cause you pain. I won't call you and we won't fight. Especially these children are usually more sensitive than other children. And remember, when a person is broken, all demands will be seen as pressure that threatens to destroy them. And they will run from it. They will have no choice. That's why Yitzchak can only come after Avram. If a person is deep down broken, for me to expect a lot from you, I have to know that you have the wholeness in you to hear it as love. If all you're going to hear from me is, I'm such a disappointment, even those expectations which are real, person is not ready for it. So Yitzchak always comes after Avram. Avram without Yitzchak is missing in the love. You're not just a broken person. You have so much, so much more that you don't know about. You can heal, you can grow. Mylan Bakaydish. You can repair your life. You can become a powerhouse. Torah mitzvahs is yours. God's blueprint for life can make you into the most successful person in the world. I see that in you. Because of my love. But for you to be able to hear it that way and integrate it that way, you really have to feel celebrated today. That almost seems like an impassable paradox. Because if I'm celebrating you today, then I make peace with it. And if I'm not celebrating you today, the person is really going to feel so difficult and so painful. So this is where the two qualities have to converge. The gvura, the demands, inform the unconditional love. Gvura informs chesed. Gvura enlightens chesed. It means you love me and you believe in me. You see greatness in me. You see potential in me. I quoted Michelangelo Hanukkah. They asked him how he sculpture David and he said I saw the angel trapped in the marble and I chiseled and chiseled away and I set the angel free I see an angel trapped in the marble but conversely the unconditional love the chesed has to inform the gvura the demands you're demanding from me not because you don't think I have inherent value what are your demands? Where are your demands coming from? Where are your expectations coming from? Because I'm a loser, right? Because I'm a disappointment. Because I'm causing you sleepless nights. Because I'm the black sheep in your family. Because I'm the bad kid. I'm the one who made you miserable. I'll only be accepted if I meet your expectations. If that's the case, the person can't grow into it. It's too painful. It's too hard to stay here. I'm going to go and run to avoid that pain. I want to feel that your love for me is non-negotiable. It's really absolute. It's really absolute. You really celebrate what is, and because you celebrate me, and because you love me, you also really want to see me shine in the most powerful way. Not that you should be able to shine, but you really want to see me shine in the most powerful way. So the fact that you have real demands, demands in a sense that you see potential, that's really the word. 
It doesn't take away from the fact that I have inherent value. On the contrary, because I have so much inherent value, you're just seeing more and more and more and more of what is in me. So therefore you will bond with me forever where I am. Really you will bond with me where I am. And again, this is not words. It's about your visceral experience. So Avram is the beginning of the story of the Jewish people. So he shows us authentic, endless love. It came with a price. The price was Yishmo was loved by his father, but he did not hold on to the holiness of his father. He didn't. Yitzchak introduces the quality of seeing people's potential and challenging them to reach that potential. It came with a price. Yitzchak saw the potential in Esau. He always did. And he spoke to him about it. And he wanted to bless him. But he could not get Esau away from his lowly behavior. He saw Yitzchak's tremendous beauty in potentiality. So there was a tragic split. There was the higher Esau and there was the lower Esau. The higher Esau remained one with Yitzchak. How did Esau die? He was beheaded. And where is his head buried? With Yitzchak. Because Yitzchak's source, Yitz, Esau's source is one with Esau. Yitzchak saw Esau in his source. Wow, Esau, I'm crazy about you. But it didn't connect with Esau the way he was down here. He was beheaded spiritually. His head is buried with Yitzchak. His body is not buried with Yitzchak. His lower part remains separated. Comes Yaakov Avinu. And Yaakov Avinu taught us the profound paradigm of synthesis. So each of his children held on to the holiness of Yaakov, the way they lived down here. Why? Yaakov knew how to connect with each child exactly the way they were, where they were right now, who you are today. I will really connect with you and celebrate you, accepting you, accepting your inherent value, celebrating it. Because of that, he can also show them how they can reach their potential and grow into the person they really, really become. Think about Reuven, and now I answer your question. When he gave, when he gave, when he rebuked Reuven on his deathbed about Bilha, what he did with Bilha, Reuven thought to himself, 60 years my father didn't talk about it. Why? 60 years he didn't talk about it. Why? Because he knew I won't be able to accept it. It's going to mean that my father hates me. Reuven said, if that's the father I have, I'm not going anywhere else. If this is my father, I'm going to go to Esau. You're going to get this by Esau? This is what it means. Yaakov was scared his whole life. It doesn't mean he was sitting and, and, and panicking his whole life. It means he was aware of what a relationship that truly helps a child feel today how celebrated they are today with all their flaws, with all their challenges, just like I celebrate me with all my flaws and challenges. Tati and mommy are also not perfect. Hint, hint. I don't mean anybody in this room. I'm just talking about me. But that child could really, really feel it. And therefore, from that place, they can also feel the calling, the, the, the beauty, the horizons that are before them, the potentiality, the future. Not to, to assuage my guilt and eliminate my shame, but as part of really being attuned to who you are and what you have inside of you and how I want you to be able to be you in the fullest sense of the word, to be able to be that soul that lives up to its full light and beauty that God sent into this world. This can be manipulative. It can be counterfeit because it has to be very, very genuine. As I said, living this way is very different than talking this way. And I'm talking from my own personal experience. I'm not preaching here as a, as a rabbi giving a shit. I'm talking from my own personal experience. I think each of our personal experiences because do you really feel acceptance or you just smile because you're a nice person but I don't accept you. 
you drive me crazy. And when you walk into the kitchen, you know how much pain you make me have, and you feel it. But when you could truly feel that closeness, you can also feel the inspiration to climb, to climb your own ladder and reach your own potential. Now, sometimes I can accept people because I don't care. <laughs> That's not a kunz. If you have no principles, you have today in America people who accept everything because they don't have principles. They don't believe in anything. You don't believe in marriage? Okay, big deal. <laughs> you don't believe that there's genders? Big deal. You don't believe there's right or wrong? Big deal. I accept everything because I'm detached from everything. I don't have any, any stakes in the game. I don't have skin in the game. I don't care. If I detach myself emotionally, everything goes. But that's not celebrating the person. It's just being aloof. It's being detached. Sometimes it's more painful to confront you. So therefore, I just go into my own ivory tower and I detach. I call it acceptance, love. But really, it may be aloofness and detachment. I'm just detached. Do whatever you want because I shut down my heart. People do that. Don't mistake that for Avraham Avinu. <laughs> I'm just detached. It's too painful. I can't deal with it. Do what you want. You know what? I'll pay your bills, but ultimately, I'm done. That's actually a form of deep, deep separation. We're talking about love that comes with deep values and deep attachment because I can really see your good and your holiness today. Sometimes expectations come because of my own selfish needs. <laughs> Therefore, I have all these expectations. It's not for you, it's for me. It's because of my stocks, not because of you. This is where Yaakov Avinu's success was. He truly integrated Avram and Yitzchak. The love, together with the care. He truly loved and remained attached, and he truly saw the potential, and therefore allowed the child to see it in himself. I believe in you so that you could start believing in yourself. So you have Avram. Yitzchak must always come after Avram. If Yitzchak comes before Avram, it's not going to work. Sensing your potentials and feeling that in yourself will only be successful if it comes from a deep sense of love and acceptance. It's demands that grow out of true self-love. It's not... The love that grows out of demands. It's a different type of love. I saw a sign, somebody said, go to the gym not because you hate your body, but because you love your body. It's I demand for myself because I like myself, not I demand for myself because I hate myself, and therefore I demand for myself so I should be able to love myself. Because when that happens, ultimately those demands... Remind me of how much I hate myself. And one day I have to detach from them. So now let's bring it full circle. This is the argument about the walls of Yerushalayim. Michal and Gavriel, the Balatanya says, are chesed and gvura. Michal is kindness, Avram Avinu. Gavriel comes from the word gvura, strength. The Gemara says about Metziah Daf Pehei that he, he had two sons, Yehuda and Chizkiah. Together they were like the Avos, Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Who was arguing? Rebchia's two sons, Yehuda and Chizkiah. The Gemara says in Mayat Katrin, Rebchia, Yehuda was on his right, Chizkiah was on his left. So Yehuda is Chesed, and Chizkiah, which means Chizik, is Gvura. Rebchia himself was like Yaakov. He's also, his name is Chaye, Chia, is alive. The Gemara says, Yaakov Avinu Loi Meis, Yaakov is alive. So Rebchia's two sons are like Michal and Gabriel. What are they arguing? Which gem is going to define the opening, the walls, the windows, through which the light of God, spiritually the light of God, will shine into the world? Which stone, which gem is going to be the dominant one? Shayam or Yashve? The difference between the onyx and the jasper is the onyx is a source of light. It's literally like a source of light. It allows you to see things. It's literally like, like the sun. It's like a source, a very powerful source of light. We're explaining the argument. Because why did Avram and Yitzchak have different qualities? When you represent a quality, it's just easy to say, snap your fingers and become something else. It doesn't work that way. 
you embody a certain quality. Michal says Shayam. Gavriel says Yashve. The other stone, Shayam, is a source of light. It allows you to see. Yashve is self-reflective. It's a very, very interesting gem. Very interesting, precious stone where the light comes from the stone itself, like rising up. It's called Erech Where were these two gems used? On the breastplate of the Kayin Gadol. Oh, and Shayam is? Oh. Yaisa, very good. Every one of the 12 tribes had a gemstone that was engraved in the breastplate. Reuven, Shim, and Levi, Yehuda. Right, you had four rows, Arba, Turim. And each one had three. The last two were Shayam and Yashve, Yosef and Binyamin. Yosef was the onyx, Binyamin was the jasper. Yosef is the giver. Yosef, who am Mashbir Bar, he is the giver. He is the one like Avram Avinu who gives and feeds. Absolute chesed. Binyamin is Ben Yamin, the son of the right. Avram is the right. Bin Yamin, Ben Yamin. He receives. He is the one who's uplifted. He's the one who's the child. He's not chesed himself. He's Ben Yamin. The Zoya says, Yosef is Sadik Elyon. Ben Yamin is Sadik Tachtoin. What does this mean? What does this mean? So let's see in conclusion <coughs> the words of the Balatanya explaining this argument and we'll see how it all comes full circle. And we'll close up. Take a look. I'm going to read this fast because I know the hour is late. You have two people. One is on a tall mountain. The other one is in a deep valley. The two want to come together. I want to come close. I'm on, a, I'm on a tall mountain. I'm on the peak of a mountain. I'm on the Himalayas. I made it to the top of the Himalayas of Mount Everest. Or easier, bare mountains. <laughs> Just a two-hour, three-hour hike. And the other person is in the deep of valley, the depth of a valley. How do we connect? So he says, there's two ways. This sums it up. Do I go down to you? Or do I throw down a rope and I say, you come up to me? That's the question. Which one? There's two people. You're trying to connect, but you're in different places. Do I go down to you? Or do I say, you come up to me? I'll help you, but you got to come up. You'll say, uh, Bo, it's not so simple. This is the biggest question today. Do I come down to you? Yes, I'm coming down to you. You don't have to move. I will be there. Or I say, no, 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 sorry. <laughs> I can't accept that. You're in the abyss. Here, come up. What happens if I say, come up? You might say, I'm not interested. <laughs> I don't have power. I don't have energy. I don't have passion. I don't have enthusiasm. The rope doesn't work. Why should I want to come up to you? If I say I come down to you, right? Do you always stay there and I always stay there with you and that's it? See how the Balatanya puts it so succinctly. This is the question. Michal is chesed. Michal is chesed. Angel. That's the angels arguing. Bachar Shayam. He says, I want the onyx. The way that godliness is going to be revealed in the world is the Shayam, the onyx. That's the stone of Yosef. Godliness should be revealed from above, downwards, like going down into the abyss. Yosef himself went down everywhere. And even though the world won't be transformed, because you're going in, you're going down, you're not lifting them up. They will still receive the revelation and the love. I don't care if you don't change. I'm coming to you. I'm not going to be separated from you. You're in the abyss. Guess what? Prepare a second share. Wow. Mommy, you're going to come here? Yes. My love will be stronger than your defiance. If you're there, I'm there. That's what Yosef represented. That's called Milmaila Lamata. We go down. But I'm not going to stay disconnected. That's what Michal says. The way that godliness is going to be revealed through the window, windows and the walls represent the channels of revelation. The light comes through the windows, comes through the walls. 
the windows and the walls. It's going to be through the onyx, the shoyam, which is a light that shines. Gavriel Gavriel says, no, 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 Yoshve. That was the stone on Binyamin. We want the worlds to be receptive for the light. We want them to be refined. We want to bring them up. And that was the difference of Yosef and Binyamin. Binyamin is the Ben Yamin. He's the child who's inspired by the love. Binyamin, it says, was Sadik Tachtain. Binyamin is the attempt to lift himself up to go to a higher place. And Binyamin had to do this ultimately after the story of Pelegesh Begiva, when the tribe was excluded and they had to fight, fight to come back, and they did. Binyamin Ze'ev Yitrof. Binyamin was, that's where the Beis Hamikdash was. The Beis Hamikdash represented the Karbanas, the Rambam says the point of the Beis Hamikdash was Karbanas, the fires that go up and bring the animal offering upwards to God. This is my challenging, my stimulating myself to climb the mountain, to take that rope and climb up. That's Binyamin. That's why it says when Rachel gave birth to Binyamin, it wasn't easy to give birth. Because birth is the re- re- revelation of the baby coming from a higher place into a lower place. And Binyamin is the opposite. Binyamin is trying to go up, so it was hard for Binyamin to be revealed in this world. Ben Oini, it was painful. Yosef goes down everywhere. Yosef puts his goblet in the sack of Binyamin. As Baltanya explains, the Gviya HaKesef. Kesef means love, desire. Yosef put love into the bag of Binyamin because without love, you're never going to be able to inspire people to really grow. So it's hidden in Binyamin, is hidden the goblet, the silver goblet of Yosef. So that's Binyamin. So Binyamin had Yashve, Jasper. Yosef had Onyx on the breastplate. The first time God mixes in. God says, you know what? Like you said, we'll have both. We'll have Onyx, we'll have Jasper, we'll have Yosef, we'll have Binyamin. We'll go down and we'll go up. Why did Hashem have to mix it? The only way you could bring together both is if you have God. If I'm busy with myself, I can't have both. Either I'm a loving person or I'm a disciplinarian. Right? Which one are you? You have you, you have your sister. Right? Your heart is just open love, 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 love. And your sister is like, uh, she runs a boot camp. As long as I'm in my own space, my own orbit, my own identity, either I'm chesed or gvura. I can't, I'm not, I can't have a split personality, one minute like this, one minute like that. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hashem says, this argument I'm going to mix into. You know why? The only way you could bring them together is if you have divine truth. Divine truth is never about my own ego. Divine truth is what's the truth that's required at this moment to be able to help this person. If that's the case, you can have infinite love and celebration. And it can also come with a very deep appreciation of the potential of the person that may come out in a year or in five years and not today. And it's not a contradiction by you. Because I'm not stuck in my own experience of you, either in pain or in disappointment or in frustration or in detachment or in acceptance or in love or in demands. I myself became a channel for infinity so I could integrate the two. Hashem says, both ultimately are one. Avram and Yitzchak are one. It's not they're two. They're really one. Real love sees the full potential. And seeing the full potential is because you know how valuable the person is now, here, today. It's not that tomorrow you become valuable. And when the person feels that and experiences that, they can really grow. Practically, if you have somebody in your life 
that person makes you truly feel valued today, not tomorrow, then you find in yourself the wholeness and you ask yourself your question, the question, and who can I be tomorrow? And how do I go a step deeper? I become vulnerable and open to my own growth. But if I don't have that assurance, then I create a defense mechanism and I stay further away from you because you're threatening me. Deep down. You understand what I'm saying? Think of it in your life. Who are the people that bring out the best in you? It's the people who see your greatness today. And therefore they help you see your greatness today. And therefore open yourself up to everything that's inside of you. Kad Kad is Chav Dalet Chav Dalet 24. How many letters are there in Baruch Shem Kvayt Malchus Eloi Lamvat? 24. We say Baruch Shem in the morning. We say Baruch Shem in the evening. Shachris was instituted by Avram Avinu. Chesed. That's the first Kad. The first 24. Mayriv is the opposite. Mayriv is nighttime. Shachris is the light coming into the world shining. Mayriv David is for me to uplift myself. There's no light coming into my life. I have to be able to discover the light. Mayriv is a different level than Shachris. Shachris is chesed. Vayashkem Avram, Baboyker Avram's light shines in the morning. And that's the chavdalad, the first chavdalad, kad. The light that flows from above. And then there's Mayriv the light that I have to create within. That light can only be created if there's the first light of Avram Avinu. Then there could be the light of Yitzchak, which is implemented in Yaakov, who is the one who made Mayriv. So Kad Kad is the two times we say Baruch Shem, and that's what Yaakov said when he heard that all of his children remained connected to his holiness. He said, Baruch Shem, Kvayt Malchus which is 24 letters. And we say it every time because we, when we say Baruch Shem, we're thanking God for our children. Why are we thanking God for our children? What if your child caused you sleepless nights for the last how long? Anybody? 18 years? From the day they were born? <laughs> From the day you got married? What are you thanking? That ability to be able to be like Yaakov, to be able to really celebrate and see that goodness. And from there, see the potential and really accept who they are today so that they can accept who they are today, so that they can celebrate who they are today, so that they can believe in themselves today and find that wholeness to be able to challenge themselves and grow. That's the Baruch Shem of Yaakov that includes the 224s, the Katkoid. So Bishaya Navi says, that's going to be your window. Hashem says, Lehevi Kedain or Kedain. It's not going to be a little bit of Shoyim and a little bit of Yashve. The Onyx and the Jasper ultimately need to become one. Just like Yaakov was one person who integrated it, who integrated Avram and Yitzchak. And that's why we say every day, Magain Avram, the protector of Avram. Yitzchak doesn't need a protector. Yitzchak is protector. Yitzchak protects. Yitzchak has boundaries. Yitzchak says, this works, this doesn't work. Yitzchak discerns. Yitzchak, has, Yitzchak is a protector. Avram is full of chesed, so there's a blessing. Magain Avram will protect Avram. Avram needs a shield. The chesed needs a shield. The chesed needs a protection. It shouldn't be misused and manipulated and exploited. So we are named Bnei Yisrael because of the gift of Yaakov. The gift of Yaakov was the true synthesis of revealing that oneness of chesed and gvura in what we call teferis, and that's where ultimate truth is emes. Because ultimate truth means not my truth, but Hashem's truth. My truth is a truth that's limited based on my character, which is beautiful. But real truth is when my character becomes a conduit for infinity, and I ask not what my child can do for me, but I ask what I can do for my child. I ask not what God can do for me, but what I can do for God. I ask not what is going to work with my personality, but I ask what is my mission right now to be able to bring out the deepest love and deepest light in the world. 
Have a wonderful and beautiful week. Yeah. 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 The Bnei Sashar says that throughout Golos, there's the void of Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. Alakei Avram, Alakei Yitzhak, you could connect to Hashem through Avram, through Yitzhak, through Yaakov. But Bechachosmen, the end of Golos is through the mid of Avram Avinu. Bnei Sashar is saying, Igrid, Igrid the Kala, Bechachosmen. There's a letter from the Baba Verebbe, the Gdusha Siyan also. Bechachosmen, at the end of Golos, the main void is Avram Avinu. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.